Jogging is a popular form of exercise for millions worldwide, offering holistic boosts to physical and mental well-being, stress reduction, and an opportunity to connect with nature. Despite its benefits, safety considerations, particularly for women, loom large, especially when navigating isolated or dimly lit paths. In 2020, a woman vanished while jogging in a rural area in Jackson County, Arkansas, bringing to the forefront the dangers that women face on a daily basis. Nestled in the heart of the picturesque Arkansas Delta, Jackson County is an agricultural haven in the eastern expanse of the state. The region is renowned for its fertile landscapes, and Jackson County stands as a flourishing hub that owes much of its economic vitality to the thriving agricultural sector. Sprawling farms dot the countryside, and among the crops that flourish, rice, soybeans, corn and cattle take centre stage. They serve as the primary contributors to the county's agricultural landscape. Located within Jackson County is the small town of Grubbs, situated near the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. It's surrounded by rolling fields, wooded expanses and a number of nature reserves and trails that wind through the hills and the valleys. Because of its small size, it's home to only several hundred people. And in 2020, one of them was 25-year-old Sydney Sutherland. Sydney and her boyfriend, Alex Nicholson, lived along Highway 18 with their dogs. The couple had been together for around four years, and in Sydney, Alex had found the perfect life partner. Sydney was kind and compassionate, traits that served her well as a nurse at the Harris Medical Centre in Newport. The couple had plans to marry in the future, but for now they were just finding their footing in their respective careers. When she wasn't working, Sydney found solace in physical activity, and she particularly enjoyed jogging. Her usual route comprised a scenic loop, weaving between County Road 41, 42, 43 and Highway 18. Because of her career, however, Sydney always jogged at a different time in the day. The jog was a very picturesque one, with nothing but rolling fields on each side of the road as well as several wooded areas dotted along the route. Because of the rural nature of the area, there were very few cars that passed her along the way, and Sydney always felt safe along her jog. On the 19th of August 2020, the weather proved favourable, with a maximum temperature of 28 degrees Celsius and a minimum of 20 degrees Celsius. Although Sydney had just returned home from a family vacation in Destin, Florida, and had spent the morning with her personal trainer at the gym, she wanted to get outside and go for a jog. It not only kept Sydney fit, but it also cleared her mind. Around 2.30pm that day, Sydney dressed in black athletic shorts, a white tank top, and pink sneakers. She texted her boyfriend Alex, who was at work, and then grabbed her cell phone and Apple Watch before heading out the front door. Typically, Sydney's jog lasted around an hour, but when Alex returned home from work at 5pm, he found that Sydney wasn't home, although her car was parked in the driveway. He called her cell phone, but it was switched off, something that was unusual for Sydney, especially while out for a jog. Alex then called up Sydney's mother Maggie, wondering if she had stopped by her home. Alex's heart fell to the pit of his stomach to learn that Sydney wasn't with her mother, and she hadn't heard from her either. Maggie told Alex that she would get in the car and search for her daughter along the jogging route. Before setting out in her car, she called up the rest of the family, who began searching for Sydney as well. Maggie drove up and down the rural road several times, but Sydney was nowhere to be found. At about 7pm, they reported Sydney missing. Born to Dion and Maggie in Jonesboro on the 18th of September 1995, Sydney's roots were firmly planted in the rural town. 
Her family cultivated not just love, but also a farm in Grubbs, a place that would shape Sydney's formative years alongside her two elder brothers, Tyler and Sam. Like many who grew up in a small town, Sydney enjoyed the close-knit community and was faithful to her friends and family. Her mother Maggie said that not only were they mother and daughter, they were best friends as well. Sydney's older brother Sam said that she was always the baby of the family, and she was the only girl on either side. Educated at Tuckerman High School, Sydney's vivacious and sweet nature made her a memorable presence. She was more than just a student. She immersed herself in extracurricular activities, leaving a mark in the Spanish club, beta club and key club. The softball field saw her prowess as she played for the Tuckerman Bulldogs, earning the distinction of outstanding senior. Then in 2014, Sydney stepped into the next chapter of her life, graduating from high school with a poignant senior quote in the yearbook, which read, The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. Her educational journey continued at ASU Newport, where she obtained her LPN license in July of 2018. Furthering her dedication to nursing, she graduated from the University of Arkansas Community College, becoming a registered nurse in December of 2019. Sydney's compassionate spirit found a home at Unity Health Harris Medical Center, where her warmth endeared her to both co-workers and patients alike. She had a delicate touch and a strong backbone, with her colleague Donna Johnson recalling. She was a petite little thing, but she was spunky. She had the most beautiful smile. It was very inviting. All of her colleagues said that she had an unwavering devotion to her patients and was at her best when caring for the elderly. As recollected by another colleague, Maddie Staggs, she always had patience. I never saw her lose it. She was such a hard worker. She never sat down. Described as a ray of sunshine, Sydney was adored by her two nieces, Mila and Lenny, who lovingly called her sassy. Beyond her commitment to human well-being, Sydney also doted on her four dogs. Her strong faith resonated at the Church of Christ, where she was an active member. After Sydney was reported missing, detectives immediately began in their search for her. Their first point of action was to try and retrace her last known movements. They knew that she had gone out that afternoon for a jog, and it was evident that she hadn't returned home. All of her belongings, including her car, were still at home, indicating that Sydney had disappeared somewhere along her jogging route. As the investigation got underway, detectives heard from a delivery driver, who had seen Sydney at about 2.30pm. She was jogging west near Arkansas 18, between Newport and Grubbs but from here, Sydney's trail disappeared. Detectives searched on foot and in vehicle along Arkansas 18 before fanning out further afield. They called in the assistance of sniffer dogs with the Arkansas Department of Corrections, as well as a helicopter from the Arkansas State Police. The small community came out in droves with around 200 volunteers and 150 police officers, firefighters and other officials. Jennifer Eddingson, one of Sydney's co-workers, said that she wasn't surprised by the outpouring of support. She commented in the media, Jackson County is just that way. We're a close community. We just want her to be safe and be found. The search parties continued, focusing along Highway 18 and the other roads in the vicinity. As the group searched near Highway 67, not too far from Sydney's home, Something in a field that ran alongside the road caught their attention. It was glistening underneath the sun, and as they drew closer, they saw that it was an iPhone. It wasn't just any iPhone, but Sydney's iPhone. The field was around 1.3 miles away from Sydney's home. The discovery prompted numerous rumours that Sydney had been struck by a vehicle and the driver panicked and disposed of her body somewhere. However, detectives were quick to refute this rumour, saying that there was no evidence to indicate that this was what had happened to Sydney. Jackson County Sheriff David Lucas announced, 
it makes it tough sometimes. When the rumours start hitting, our phones start ringing. It hinders us quite a bit. Detectives also put out an appeal, asking that if anybody had travelled on Highway 67, from 2pm until 5pm on the day that Sydney disappeared, to get in contact if they saw anything suspicious. They soon got a phone call from somebody who reported seeing Sydney on her cell phone in that area. While they didn't see anything that was necessarily suspicious, they did observe that there was a pickup truck in the area at the same time. Sydney's family and friends were all active in the search, scarring through the area on foot and in car. Her friend Savannah Reynolds commented in the media, Everybody obviously loves her, and you can tell by all of the people out here looking. We won't ever stop searching. As darkness descended on the area, the searchers called it a day, but they were back on the scene early the next morning. As they searched, a tip came in from a woman named Gracie Llewellyn. She appeared to be emotional as she told detectives that on the day that Sydney disappeared, her husband returned home with a mysterious dent in his pickup truck. She was married to 28-year-old Quake Llewellyn, a local farmer, and they lived with Llewellyn's parents on their sprawling farm. After receiving the tip, detectives spoke with Quake Llewellyn's mother, Kerry, who provided them with a security video from their property. In the video, a clear den could be seen on Llewellyn's pickup truck, and Gracie and Kerry maintained that it wasn't there when he left on the morning of the 19th of August. Detectives working on the case already knew Quake Llewellyn at this stage. He had called them just the day before and told them that he had seen Sydney walking along the road some time before she disappeared. Other than the delivery driver, Quake Llewellyn was the last person to have ever seen Sydney. Llewellyn had actually participated in the search for Sydney. Being from such a small town, everybody knew one another. While searching, Sydney's mother begged Llewellyn if he had seen anything suspicious after learning that he had seen her before she disappeared. He replied, Nope, she was just running. Quick Llewellyn grew up in Newport, Arkansas, experiencing the challenges of his parents' divorce during his early years, around first or second grade. Following the divorce, custody was granted to his mother, Carrie, and although he maintained sporadic contact with his father over the years, his upbringing was marked by the absence of a constant father presence. When Llewellyn turned 10, his mother remarried, but the second marriage also ended in divorce just a couple of years later. However, a significant turning point occurred when Llewellyn was in the ninth grade. His mother found stability and companionship, with a local farmer named Michael Llewellyn. Michael soon became the primary father figure in Llewellyn's life, and in time he decided to officially adopt him. The Llewellyn family, now anchored by Michael, provided Llewellyn with a nurturing environment filled with love and warmth, a stark contrast to the previous male figures in his mother's life. Michael had inherited a legacy of farming, and healed from generations of successful farmers. Alongside his father, Donald, they managed thriving farms in the region. Llewellyn Farms was a testament to their agricultural prowess, spanning 5,800 acres across four counties, including Jackson, Independence, Point Said, and Craighead. Following his graduation from Tuckerman High School with a mix of C's and B's, Llewellyn transitioned into working alongside his father and grandfather on their farms. His responsibilities included hauling seeds and contributing to the day-to-day operations. At the age of 23, Llewellyn made the decision to move out of the family home. Two years later, he tied the knot with Gracie, a local woman with three children of her own. The newly formed family settled into a rented home, with aspirations of becoming homeowners. Driven by a strong work ethic, Llewellyn dedicated extensive hours to the farm, diligently saving money for their dream of home ownership. 
In 2016, their commitment and contributions to agriculture were recognised when the family was honoured as Jackson County Farm Family of the Year. Michael expressed the family's farmacing legacy and remarked to Arkansas Online, We are a true family farm. From my dad Donald to me and my son, Quick. Then in 2020, Llewellyn, Gracie and her three children moved in with his parents in order to save money so that they could one day build their own home. Despite the cramped living conditions, the atmosphere in the home was always good. Gracie and Carrie looked after the children, while Llewellyn and his father worked at the farm. Detectives were keen to learn more about Quake Llewellyn after they spoke with Gracie and Carrie. He was brought in to be interviewed by officers from the Arkansas State Police. He said that he knew of Sydney's disappearance and that he knew her but only barely. Llewellyn and Sydney had actually attended the same school in Tuckerman, which only had around 50 students per grade. As detectives delved into the investigation, they scrutinised Llewellyn's online presence. It was revealed that he and Sydney had been Facebook friends, but he had recently removed her from his friends list, a timing that raised suspicion among detectives. Adding to the intrigue, Llewellyn was a member of the Facebook group established to aid in the search for Sydney. Granting detectives permission, Llewellyn allowed them to search his GMC Sierra truck, which had a large dent. During the search, detectives made a concerning discovery. There was blood in the crevices of the tailgate. With the evidence against Llewellyn mounting, detectives obtained a search warrant for his cell phone. It was discovered that he had an app called the 360 app, which tracked his location. It showed that he had been 2.26 miles northwest of where Sydney's cell phone was discovered around the same time that she disappeared. Furthermore, the data suggested that he had lingered in that vicinity for an extended period. With this crucial information in hand, detectives converged on the specified area, surrounded by fields and farmland. They initiated a meticulous search, and in an isolated field they came across a disturbed patch of land. Armed with shovels, they carefully excavated the soil, eventually uncovering the lifeless body of Sydney. She bore the evidence of a violent encounter, with bruises and wounds, and her shorts had been forcibly removed. Detectives swiftly cordoned off the area with crime scene tape, summoning forensic experts to meticulously examine the scene. Several country roads were temporarily closed as part of the investigative efforts. Once the crime scene had been thoroughly processed and documented, Sydney's body was carefully transported to the Arkansas State Crime Lab in Little Rock. The following day, DNA testing proved that the body was indeed Sydney. She had been sexually assaulted, and her cause of death was listed as multiple blunt force injuries. Quake Llewellyn was immediately arrested on suspicion of capital murder, kidnapping and rape in the murder of Sydney. Detectives had suspected that Llewellyn would deny any involvement in Sydney's murder, but once he was brought into the interrogation room, he made a full confession. According to his account, on the day of Sydney's murder... He was en route to inspect wells and rice fields. While driving westbound on County Road 41, he spotted Sydney jogging alone. After passing her, he executed a U-turn and accelerated towards her, hitting her with his pickup truck. According to Llewellyn, he then bundled Sydney into the back of his truck. He drove around three miles to an isolated field in Newport, where he removed her shorts and raped her on the tailgate of his truck. He then used a shovel that was in his pickup truck to dig a hole, and then placed Sydney's body in the hole. While detectives had a confession, they still needed more corroborating evidence. At the family's farm, Carrie allowed them to come inside and search. 
Inside Llewellyn's bedroom, they came across a pair of tan shoes that matched the pair that Llewellyn was wearing on the security footage at the home on the day of Sydney's murder. These were removed from the home and then compared to the shoe imprints that led to Sydney's grave. The tread on the shoes came back as a match, further implicating Llewellyn in the murder. After Llewellyn's confession and arrest, he was ordered to be held without bond. During the brief court hearing, Sydney's family were visibly upset, while Llewellyn remained emotionless. As the case was making its way through the justice system, safety for women while jogging gained widespread attention. The case drew national coverage with programs such as Good Morning America addressing the matter and encouraging women to exercise additional caution when venturing out alone. During this period, the persistence of COVID-19 restrictions and the closure of numerous gyms worldwide prompted a surge in the number of individuals taking up jogging as a means to stay active. The surge had a notable impact on the online sales of athletic gear, with Forbes reporting that Reebok experienced a remarkable doubling of its online sales compared to the preceding year. Unfortunately, this newfound enthusiasm for jogging was met by a concerning rise in attacks on women who were jogging solo. Sydney's tragic murder sent shockwaves across the globe, intensifying the apprehension felt by women who had embraced jogging during the pandemic. Just the month beforehand, 43-year-old Sarmis Thethsen had been killed in Texas while out on a jog. Safety expert Jared Arthur offered invaluable advice to women looking to safeguard themselves while jogging. Her primary recommendation included avoiding the use of headphones to remain alert to their surroundings and refraining from wearing baggy clothing or ponytails, which could be easily grabbed by potential assailants. Additionally, Arthur suggested diversifying jogging routes to prevent the establishment of predictable patterns making it more difficult for someone to target them by observing a routine. In the face of these challenges, the broader conversation around women's safety expanded, prompting individuals and communities to address the need for increased vigilance and protective measures for those engaging in outdoor activities. On the 4th of September, Lou Ellen's wife, Gracie, filed for divorce. In the filing, she said that her husband had committed acts which amount to general indignities. Then on the 19th of October, Llewellyn was formally charged with kidnapping, rape, capital murder and abuse of a corpse. He subsequently pleaded not guilty to the charges against him and filed paperwork seeking a jury trial. Following his plea, Sydney's mother Maggie said in the media that he deserved to die for what he had done. She commented, He is a monster, an evil monster. She did not deserve any of that. She said that the entire family and community were still in shock and that they were living in a nightmare. She then added, As a family, we are living day to day and trying to get through this tragedy. We are grieving the best way we know how. There isn't a day that goes by that we don't think of her and miss her pretty smile. Maggie said that she often found herself gravitating to the area where her daughter was last seen alive and the area where her body was found. She stated, I still go to where it was at. I've walked it. I've done every step she's taken to try and see what happened. He will never tell the truth. The following month, Llewellyn's defence attorney, Bill James, announced that he was seeking a mental health evaluation for him. He said that he had reason to believe that his client had a mental disease or defect, and because of this, he may not have the capacity to understand the case against him. He also raised concerns about Llewellyn's ability to assist in his own defence. He wanted the evaluation to also include testing for any mental disabilities. Jackson County Circuit Judge Harold Irwin subsequently ordered a psychiatric evaluation for Quake Llewellyn. When Lou Allen sat down to speak with psychologist Dr. Lacey Wiley, he tried to claim that Sydney's murder was accidental. He said that when he turned around after spotting Sydney, a dust of cloud meant that he couldn't actually see her when he hit her. He claimed that he believed she was dead at that point, and although he hadn't been drinking or using any drugs, he was afraid he was going to get into trouble. 
Instead of calling for help, Llewellyn said that he bundled Sydney into the tailgate of his truck, with the intention of hiding her. Llewellyn also said that after killing Sydney, he tried messing with her corpse. He didn't go into detail about what he did with Sydney's body, after being advised not to by his defence attorney. Afterwards, he said that he spent two to three hours checking wells before returning home. Here, he had dinner and then went to bed to try and forget about what had happened. The next morning, he said that he went to work like normal. He said that the murder and the events surrounding it were just a blur. He commented, I knew I didn't kill her on purpose. When asked why he didn't call 911, he said that he was too afraid. He further said that he had called detectives and claimed that he saw Sydney walking along the road before she disappeared. He explained that he was just hoping that he wouldn't get caught. Dr. Wiley determined that Llewellyn was mentally fit to stand trial and that he understood the judicial process. She noted, He expressed that he would like to take his case to trial so that he could get his story out there to whoever needs to hear it. While Llewellyn maintained he had accidentally struck Sydney with his pickup truck, detectives said that he did it on purpose and did it with the intent to rape and kill her. He had also shied away from saying that he had raped Sydney, like he had told detectives, and instead said that he had just tried to mess with her. Dr. Wiley found no evidence of mental disease or defect that would cause Llewellyn to not know what he was doing. In her report, she wrote, Rather, he maintained his own form at that time and engaged in a number of rational, goal-directed behaviours before and after the offence such as completing farm tasks the day of and the day following the offence, and having dinner with his family. Moreover, he reported that he was not feeling different or experiencing any stressors during the time frame of the offence. She believed that Llewellyn was able to appreciate that his actions were wrong, and he proved that by hiding Sydney's body in his truck, burying her, and then keeping what he had done to himself. Her report continued, Importantly, there's no indication that he was experiencing any symptoms of a mental disease or mental defect at the time of the offence that would have led him to believe he had a legal right to commit any of the allegations against him. This decision meant that Llewellyn would be standing trial for Sydney's murder, and her family publicly announced that they were ecstatic, but anxious. Shortly after the evaluation report was finalised, it was announced that a foundation had been set up in Sydney's memory. In March, Arkansas State University Newport awarded the Sydney Sutherland Memorial Scholarship to its first recipients. They were both awarded a $500 renewable scholarship to help them continue their education in the nursing profession. Sydney's family were there to help present the checks, with her mother Maggie commenting, We can't thank the community enough for helping us keep Sydney's memory alive in such a positive way. The scholarship is just one way we can keep Sydney's light shining. Then in April, it was decided by the Jackson County Quorum Court that they would rename the overpass on Jackson Road 41 in honour of Sydney. Because of the coronavirus, the case was moving very slowly through the justice system. Almost all trials had been delayed over and over again, making a backlog. Prosecutor Ryan Cooper announced in May that he was going to be pushing for the death penalty for Llewellyn if he were convicted. Defence attorney James responded by filing 48 different motions against the death penalty. He argued, What happened was a horrible accident, and nothing about it was intentional. He also requested a change of venue because Llewellyn asserted that the minds of citizens of Jackson County were so prejudiced against him that he wouldn't be granted a fair trial. The judge ultimately agreed with the defence and moved the upcoming murder trial to Lawrence County. Judge Rob Ratton stated in his ruling, Based on the extensive publicity and media interest this case has attracted, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to assemble a fair and impartial jury in Jackson County. Then on the 1st of October, Quake Llewellyn was escorted into court where it was announced that he had reached a plea agreement. 
He pleaded guilty to charges of capital murder and rape to avoid a potential death sentence. The plea agreement had been made with the consent of Sidney's family, although they had wanted him to be sentenced to death. They were all there to see Lou Allen be sentenced, and Maggie presented a poignant victim impact statement. Through tears, she said, Today we cross the finish line in our fight for justice for Sydney. She should be here. As she spoke, she ordered Lou Allen to look at her. She then continued, asking him, What you took from us 408 days ago, we'll never get again. Was it really worth it? She said that he was cruel as they searched for Sydney as he knew exactly where she was and knew that she was never coming home. She then added, She was not yours to take. Satan is real. The hands you hugged me with are the same hands you killed her with. She was referring to the fact that when searching for Sydney, Llewellyn had offered her support and hugged her. In a written statement, Sydney's father Dion said, Quick. You're a 300-pound coward that hit my 100-pound daughter with a 3,000-pound truck. Sydney's brother Sam was so overcome with emotion that a friend read his victim impact statement for him. He said that he had endured sleepless nights since the last day he saw his sister alive. It broke him to explain to his own five-year-old daughter why Aunt Sassy wasn't around anymore. He said that while he believed Llewellyn should die for what he did, the plea was better for himself and the family, because they knew he would spend the rest of his life in prison. Quick Llewellyn was then formally sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the age of connectivity, the constant presence of smartphones has inadvertently become an important tool in the realm of criminal investigations. Murderers who once shrouded in anonymity now find themselves ensnared by the very devices they carry in their pockets. As silent witnesses to their every move, cell phones leave a digital trail of breadcrumbs, constantly pinging locations. In the case of Sydney Sutherland, Quick Llewellyn's cell phone served as the catalyst to his downfall. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I'd like to say a massive thank you to my newest supporters up on Patreon, Katie, Nicole, and Stephanie. If you'd like to join us up on Patreon, the link is in the show notes. I'd just like to say I hope that everybody had a fantastic festive period and a happy new year. Thank you all so much for the support for the past year. It really does mean the world. I'm not actually sure if I mentioned it in any other episodes, but my new true crime book, Killers Caught, was published in October of last year. You can buy Killers Caught on Amazon and in all good bookstores, as well as a few supermarkets in America, including Walmart and Target. For this year, I'd love to grow our community up on Facebook, so if you haven't done so already, please consider joining the Morbidology Facebook group. Feel free to post some thoughts or comments on any of the episodes because I'd really love to chat with you all some more this year. Remember to check us out at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read some true crime articles. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe and have an amazing week.